Hello, we welcome you to today's webinar on weather and climate data dissemination. Thank you so much for joining us. My colleagues and I will introduce how the ArcGIS ecosystem supports the dissemination of weather and climate data, information products and apps using a fully web-enabled GIS. Businesses, government agencies, and individuals rely on weather and climate information to protect lives and property, to understand our planet, to drive economic growth, and support data-driven decision. Thus, having access to weather and climate data is of great importance. Today's webinar will be recorded and made available for future viewings. We will keep you on mute during this session, but encourage you to drop your questions or comments in the chat at any time throughout the presentation. We will take time at the end of this session to address your questions. We will also take time to engage with you in two polls to have some understanding of your interest in this field. Note that all the examples and use cases discussed throughout today's session will be supplied at res as resources in a follow-up email so that you can further enhance your knowledge on weather and climate data um, dissemination using a fully web-enabled GIS. My name is Lorraine. I am the Director of Earth Sciences Solutions at ESRI focused on geospatial technology for Earth Sciences applications. I'm also joined today by Dan Pursuit, the Environmental Content Lead for, the Living, for ESRI's Living Atlas of the World. He also has extensive background in climate science. We have Julia Bear, an ESRI Solution Engineer supporting national government customers in using geospatial technology. And we have George Thompson, a geospatial technology and strategy advisor helping ESRI clients to be successful with geospatial technology and strategy with a focus on weather agenda, or technologies. Today's agenda includes brief presentations and demonstrations on the resources, workflows, and tips that have been developed by ESRI to support the dissemination of weather and climate data. After a brief overview, we will move into the technical portion of the agenda led by Dan and Julia. Today's webinar is um, the third in a five-part series on applied meteorology using ArcGIS. The first two webinars in this series have already been recorded and are available for your viewing. The titles and dates of the next two webinars in this series are listed here on the slide. This webinar series takes you on a journey to see how ArcGIS advances the understanding of the atmosphere to benefit science and society. We welcome you to continue with us on this journey. ArcGIS is transforming data dissemination. Shown here are some examples of using GIS to disseminate massive volumes of weather and climate data. For example, the Atmospheric Science Data Center at NASA Langley Research Center leverages GIS for the processing, archival, and distribution of NASA solid earth science data. As we also support, supports a wide variety of enterprise GIS operations within NOAA's National Weather Service, as well as multi-agency National Ice Center, the U.S. Navy, and the U.S. Coast Guard. The National Ice Center's satellite image processing and analysis system, for example, is guided by ArcGIS sea ice and iceberg maps, which help to ensure safety, or sorry, safe navigation in polar regions for ships operating near or beneath, uh, through and beneath sea ice. You will get to see a variety of these types of data, as well as others being disseminated within a fully web-enabled GIS. We're going to have our first poll question coming up, and then I will turn it over to Dan. In your line of work, would you be considered a producer of weather and climate data sets to be served to the users or a consumer of those data sets, or perhaps both? We look forward to hear your answers, and we will share the results with you once they come in. Well, it looks like we have a large number of folks being both um, producers as well as consumers of large quantities of data. So this is very neat to see. Thanks so much for conducting or filling out this poll. Now over to you, Dan. 
All right, thanks, Lorraine. So as uh, Lorraine mentioned, my name is Dan Pesut, and I lead our environment content for the Living Atlas of the World. Um, and I've been working in uh, uh, meteorology, weather, and climate sciences for a long time now. And one thing I can say is that our community is very diverse. It's not just the pure meteorologists uh, that work with weather data. It's people from multiple uh, different organizations and backgrounds. Um, and, and, and they're all trying to use that weather and climate data to guide their situa situational awareness or assess risk to their particular industry. And I think one of the important things that I've started to learn from that is, you know, we don't all speak in the same language. Uh, people who work in agriculture speak different languages than uh, people who work in pure meteorology, and that's different than uh, petroleum industries. And so that we have to make sure that when we are disseminating data, we're doing it in a way in which we're maintaining the context and providing the full value of that information. And so, you know, I think we're talking here mostly about data dissemination, but I really like to think about information dissemination. We're not uh, ideally looking at uh, just putting out the ones and zeros. We're talking about developing information products that everybody can use. And those could be a, a, in a lot of different forms. We have things like RGS Pro packages, uh, annotated Jupyter notebooks, uh, informative web maps, interactive applications, and engaging story maps that provide context to data, um, and performant web services, which is what I'm going to be focusing on today. Uh, we're starting to see a new pattern emerge in how we share information, and that is what we like to call a global GIS. So it's not that you know I, I work with um, a project on my computer, and I am a uh, you know a, a team of one, you know GIS team of one. What's happening more and more is that we are collaborating across projects. We are publishing things to our organizations so that they can better leverage the work that I'm doing and then you know, have that sense of collaboration across a large project. And then sometimes we're taking the, the results of that and we're publishing it back out. Maybe it's going into a web app that other people can browse. Maybe it's going into a hub for open data um, and community building. Maybe it's going into ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World so that everybody can find it and bring it into their GIS. But we're starting to create this connectivity um, and I think it really use that we get in our information products, our GIS products. Um, and with that, we really have to start to make sure that these things are very usable across this really broad community. So I think a really great example of that is this app that was developed um, for air quality in the United States. And this leverages uh, different layers that have been published by different organizations, and they're all just kind of mashed up here. So we have EPA air quality data that we can see here once we click on a spot, and we can get the, you know, the current and the future uh, air quality from the Air Now program. We can bring in weather forecast data from NOAA. Um, and all we have to do is, is you know, kind of query that on the fly. We can also bring in census data um, to show uh, the demographics and, and, and the populations that are at risk in these different areas of, of poorer air quality. And then we can compare that easily with other areas. This is highly dynamic. And, and that's because these things have been published um, and published well. And the, and, and the layers themselves are really great information products. This is a custom, or this is the, the default pop-up that's associated with the, with the, with the area. I really got to applaud, applaud EPA on uh, providing that, that level of detail here. Another really great example when we get into uh, climate is looking at another app that can be developed that leverages WebGIS. And here we have NASA's GLDAS, which is a hydrology reanalysis model. We, there's lots of different variables that we can select here. Uh, we can go from soil moisture to precipitation um, and back over. And then, you know, if I if I come over and I just click on a spot here in, in Central Africa, we can get the full time series of that of that data and start to poke around and explore. And we can do this without downloading a single megabyte of, of data onto our computers. You can almost get into a, a cursory analysis and look at trends and patterns here, um, again, just by leveraging WebGIS. Web and that could be something that's in your organization 
or for the public to use. And of course, we can switch over to, to other variables and now start to look at patterns across um, these multidimensional components here. Um, so we might see a peak here, be interested in it, and then see how that relates to other variables. So this is really powerful stuff. This would take you know days of development um, just to be able to do this on your own personal computer. And now this is available broadly for everybody to use because it's leveraging really uh, well-crafted WebGIS technology. So another example might be, um, I, I, I developed this analysis of uh, wildfire risk uh, for the state of California. And so we're looking at areas with high population density, but then areas with high risk. And I was able to do that without going and downloading anything. So um, I could go over into my ArcGIS Pro project, click on portal, click on living atlas of the world, and then I could type in wildfire community risk. And there's a bunch of resources that are available. These are a variety of feature layers and web maps and image services. There's a whole collection that have been contributed from the US Forest Service that look at wildfire risk. And all I have to do is drag it into my project here. So this is now gonna stream data into my ArcGIS Pro project. And this was how I started that, that analysis that you saw with the hex bins. Um, you know, you can go over and, and change you know, the blending modes if you haven't played with blending modes yet. This is really great, especially when you have things like wildfire, which might be uh, terrain associated. Um, so uh, as this is gonna start to render out, I'm gonna zoom into one of those areas that were, that were high risk. And um, I'll, sometimes the, the rendering takes a little bit of time here, but um, since we're, we're doing an, an overlay, but we'll be able to see areas um, in context with the terrain itself without having to work with transparency here. And so this is the starting point that, you know, we had to then go in and run the analysis. We don't have to download, I think the, the state of California is three, three gigabytes for this one raster data set. We didn't have to download anything. We can now just start to run our analysis tools directly um, on the service. And so that's uh, the, the, you know, kind of kicking off the idea of, of WebGIS and really well uh, developed uh, services. Um, we're gonna go into a poll and then uh, do a deeper dive into how to build those services. So the next poll is to really find out about what type of information you are, or what type of packages you are using to analyze your data. So are you working with Jupyter Notebooks, Python scripting, R, ArcGIS, or other? And you can um, provide more than one answer. So take some time to think about what you're doing in your work projects and what um, analysis um, you're performing. Thank you so much, Dan. So I'm going to share my screen here and talk about how do we integrate and disseminate information with ArcGIS. And so my presentation here today is going to focus on how we start by ingesting data, publishing it, and then collaborating it, collaborating with our data and our informa information products. And so to get started, as Dan talked about, when working with um, information from the Arc ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World, we have a repository of hosted um, hosted and authoritative data for you to work with. So just by typing in something like wildfires, you can easily add it um, to your content, whether in a WebGIS environment, so ArcGIS Online, a desktop environment like ArcGIS Pro, or with ArcGIS Notebooks. So taking our Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks and putting them into ArcGIS, into ArcGIS to use um, a spatial and geographic lens to more advanced analysis. When working and ingesting weather data, many times we're working with multi-dimensional data, commonly in formats like a net CDF. Um, and in ArcGIS Pro, we support these data formats and have specific tools to enable further visualization and analysis on this, on this data. I do wanna mention, I know this isn't the focus of the webinar. If you're interested in analysis, we do have past recordings from our two prior webinars that focus on more in-depth analysis. But within our GIS Pro, we have um, tools, both geoprocessing tools and raster functions to work with both vector and raster data to, so, to go beyond the, the visualizations and do more in-depth analysis. 
And with that, I'm going to jump into my demonstration focused on getting started with ingesting data. And so I'm going to start by working in ArcGIS Pro. You'll notice that I'm signed into an ArcGIS online organization. And I want to get started adding data to my map. Um, so going into add data, I have a variety of different places in um, and where I can add data from. I can add data locally hosted. I can also, because I've signed into my ArcGIS Online organization here, I can add data from ArcGIS Online, both content that I've created and published out, as well as content that's been shared within my organization. So if someone has published a feature layer that you want to work with and they've shared it to the organization, by connecting to your organization within ArcGIS Pro, you're able to bring in that data that way. And of course, from the Living Atlas. And I'm going to focus on my demonstration on a layer from NOAA showing storm events from the year 1950 to 2019. So this layer right here. And to speed things up, I've preloaded this layer to my map. And I can visualize the over 1.6 million storm events that have occurred um, in those almost 70 years. And now this is a and I so this is a lot of points on a map, it can be hard to visualize. Um, and so we, and so I filtered it down specifically to look at tornadoes that have occurred in 2019. And beyond just the points on a map and the visuals, visuals provided there, within ArcGIS Pro, we can go beyond that and create charts and tables um, to visualize this even further and gain an understanding of our data and so here I'm interested in understanding when tornadoes were occurring in 2019, going beyond just the year and visualizing it based off of um, months of the year that are most likely to have tornadoes. And so to do that, I'm gonna create a calendar heat chart. And going into my chart properties, I can configure the variable. So in this case, I'm interested in the date and looking at the year. 2019, um, what month what month it's occurring in, and the day of the month where my my storm is occurring, and I have this table preloaded here. And while that table loads, I also do want to mention that just as I can bring in layers of inform layers of data I have, I can also add notebooks. So if you're working with notebooks, whether a local notebook file you have or connecting to ArcGIS online, you can bring in a notebook there. So I'll get back to my chart while it loads. Um, but I wanted to touch on raster data as well. So just as you can bring in vector data and work with vector data in ArcGIS Pro, you can also work with raster data. I'm sorry, my ArcGIS Pro is being a bit slow. And so I've loaded in a layer showing sea surface temperature. I'm actually going to close my pro quickly here and reopen it. Sorry about this. Uh, so I wait while I wait for my pro to restart, I'm going to focus in on the next phase, the next steps I'm going to talk about with ArcGIS Pro. So publishing the work we're doing from Pro into ArcGIS Online. Um, so we've talked about adding data, both local data as well as um, data from ArcGIS Online, such as from the Living Atlas. And the next step is to publish these layers. Um, 
the layers that you've created into ArcGIS online or portal so other people can visualize this information and this analysis without needing access to that same desktop environment. Um, a story I like to tell is that when I started with ArcGIS, um, I started an ArcMap and I didn't even know you could publish to ArcGIS online or portal. But with Pro, the idea of WebGIS is so central to the application and how it's laid out. It really makes it seamless to publish your layers and maps with our sharing ribbon and interface. And we have tools to share both feature services, so vector data, points, lines, and polygons, as well as raster data. And then once you share your items to ArcGIS Online or your portal, they're automatically added um, for you to start working on, and you can showcase them in maps and applications. So creating items directly into ArcGIS Online or portal for ArcGIS and working with them there. We can also work with imagery in um, in ArcGIS with ArcGIS Image Server. So using Image Services, sharing it out with ArcGIS Image Server, and publishing to with ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Enterprise, or excuse me, publishing from ArcGIS Pro to ArcGIS Enterprise. One of our latest products, it's currently in pre-release, but it is available for early adopters, is ArcGIS Image for ArcGIS Online. And this product allows you to host, analyze, and stream your imagery and raster collection directly into ArcGIS Online. And then finally, with our latest release, I wanted to talk about how you can now schedule ArcGIS notebooks in ArcGIS Online, and you can use this as a tool to manage and update your data on a regular interval. So now I'm gonna um, jump into a demonstration on talking about publishing feature services and image layer and image services. But before I do that, I did wanna finish up my pro is back. Um, I did wanna finish up talking about some of the charting capabilities and working with raster data. And so as I mentioned, I have created a chart here in pro um, to look at when storm events are occurring by day of the month. So if I click here on December 16th, I can see points on a map specifically where those storms were happening. So taking into account that, that um, temporal aspect of our data and putting it in a chart to visualize within ArcGIS Pro alongside our map. And now going back to my raster data. So as I talked about adding data, if I wanna work with a multi-dimensional raster layer, um, many weather agencies like NOAA, they publish their data as a multi-dimensional raster. And I have a layer here showing sea surface temperature from the last 35 years um, from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And I want to visualize this, this layer within ArcGIS Pro. So just by clicking on my layer, I have that visualized. I can see, as we might expect, um, hotter temperatures around the equator, cooler temperatures around the poles. And since this layer is time enabled um, and it's a multi-dimensional layer as well, the contextual ribbon opens and I can click on a specific time slice. So here I am in 2005, but if I wanna understand what temperatures looked like in the 90s, I can click on that time slice and see how the temperature has changed. And one area I'm specifically focused in around is off the coast of Australia, an area of high biodiversity and importance and going back to my multi-dimensional toolbar here, I can go beyond just, again, beyond just visuals on a map and create a temporal profile. Um, so if I wanna look at a specific area of interest, in this case, I'm gonna choose an area of interest off the coast of Australia, and I wanna configure this to look at it every year rather than um, that seasonal fluctuation. So now I get a, a clear view of how sea, sea surface temperatures have been increased over time, um, taking into account that those charting aspects. But now I wanna transition to talking about sharing out my analysis I'm doing in ArcGIS Pro um, into ArcGIS Online or Portal for ArcGIS. And so I previously have created an additional feature layer using some of our analysis tools that I wanna share into ArcGIS Online for other people to visualize. And to do that, I have my sharing tab here at the top. 
and I can choose to either package up this project as a whole, so if I want to share the whole project, as well as this specific layer. And so I can give this feature layer a name, um, a bit of information, and now I see it displayed within ArcGIS Online for me to use. So I both have, I can package up and share my project as a whole, so now it's available in ArcGIS Online or for Portal for people to download and work with, as well as the specific feature layer that I've shared out from ArcGIS Pro, and I've created a quick application to visualize it. I also talked about ArcGIS Image um, and sharing out imagery layers into ArcGIS Online, and here I have um, a raster layer showing sea surface temperature predictions off the coast of Australia, and I've shared this directly into ArcGIS Online. Again, um, now anyone within my organization can visualize it, create applications, um, and take advantage of this, this weather data. And the final part of my workflow is talking about collaboration and creating applications with, with this data and this map. And to get into this section, I wanted to highlight um, some of the applications that users within our weather community have created to collaborate um, and connect the public with weather data. So this first example, sticking on the idea of Australia and sea surface temperature is created with ArcGIS dashboards using data from NOAA's Coral Reef Watch program. It's all configurable. I can click on the graph here on the side um, and zoom into areas that are under a high alert right now. Um, so taking advantage of dashboards and configurable widgets um, to make the map more interactive. Also from the National Weather Service, I have, I like to highlight this um, that they have on their, their website, this application. It's a tab story map, but visualizing radar, the national forecast chart, and really sharing out weather data to save lives and inform others of hazards and potential weather events occurring. Also from the National Weather Service, the Safer Hazard Dashboard currently looks like it's a pretty calm weather day, but I do see the severe thunderstorm warning. So providing, again, more situational awareness today on today's hazards, storm predictions through a configurable application within ArcGIS Online. And then when talking about configurable applications, I also like to talk about ArcGIS Hub um, and the FEMA Geospatial Resource Center, the hub that they've created focused around specific disasters. So if I'm interested in hurricanes, I can click on the hurricanes page and see a variety of different configurable applications taking advantage of feature services around weather information um, shared out and published into these applications for anyone to visualize and understand where weather events are occurring. And my final example of collaboration is our um, Climate Hub, so created and managed by Esri. And this is a great resource to get climate data, visualize applications, um, and see a great example of collaboration around weather at work. So that, um, so this the Water Balance app that Dan had talked about is featured here. We also have Learn Lessons examples, um, so a tool we use to share out climate and weather information, um, just like these weather community examples I have showed. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Dan. All right, thank you, Julia. May you make you the presenter. All right, so um, that was that was really exciting. You got to see some of the, the ways in which you can both use uh, services and, and content that's been shared with you and then also share them back. I would like to say that, you know, when, you know, we, when Julia was showing the, the sea surface temperature data that was brought in as a net CDF file, if, if your, um, if your analytical uh, image service is configured properly, you can do all those things on the fly, just like she was doing with the, with the, um, the local file, which is, you know, really exciting. So I'm going to extend what, uh, what Julia talked about and then uh, you know, she showed you how to publish um, some different things over into ArcGIS Online, like uh, the the hexagon uh, summary of tornadoes. But how can you really make those things work well for other people? 
So there's a couple things to consider, and I'm gonna break this down a little bit into before and after and with the different types of data that you might be, or information products that you might be looking to publish. So first with that raster data, so it could be that, that example of sea surface temperature or the wildfire uh, risk layer. Um, does the intended use match the projection? If you want people to be able to analyze the data, it should be uh, served back out in the original projection so we're not um, inserting distortions into the pixels as we're doing that. If all you are intending is for visualization, then think about the map projection that things will be visualized in and things will work that much faster. A lot of things are web mercator. Um, and so it might be faster if all you're thinking about is visualization to do it that way. Um, is the projected resolution and tolerance realistic? So when you go into your settings as, as you're configuring your layer, you know if you have a five kilometer data set, it doesn't need 0 0.01 meter tolerances. You're having to stream that much more information over the web into somebody who's who's using it. So you know knock that thing back to a realistic resolution and tolerance. Um, if you're building a time series or a multi-variable service, there's an option to build multi-dimensional info onto your mosaic uh, image services. And then when somebody brings it into their project, that, that multi-dimensional analysis toolbar that Julia showed with the, with the ability to do the, the graphing um, profile, um, that will be enabled. It, it, it's not by default. You have to basically tell your service that this is multi-dimensional. Uh, one, one thing that I always try to, to get people to do is uh, more like WMS services, but um, ArcGIS um, image uh, server can handle the full float scientific values. So if you're using image server, make those things available unless all you're, again, all you're trying to do is visualization. But you know, if, if you have the scientific, if you have the capacity to put the, the the actual data values in there that's just making your your layers more versatile for for other applications um, and then raster templates these are one of my favorite things um, so here on the the screen this is a multi-dimensional um, multi-variable model um, called HiCom and into this into one service we built multiple variables in there so you can switch easily back and forth and you don't have to load in a new data set or find it in um, in living atlas or arches online or within your portal um, and then it also reduces the footprint uh, or the, the the resource load on your server um, this is one service instead of you know six or seven other ones um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about you know before you publish your, your feature layer, so your points, lines, and polygons. Um, how optimized are the fields? You know, do you really need floating point? If you can convert to an integer, you know, you know convert from um, millimeters uh, to centimeters or centimeters to millimeters, you know, vice versa, um, to get rid of the floating points, that's gonna make it a lot uh, faster to, to stream the data over. Um, it, it, do you really need six uh, decimal points? Most data does not have that kind of precision. So to round it up to one or two decimals or um, you know, kind of configure it to what is really meaningful. Again, trying to reduce the amount of data that you're, you're streaming. Again, with the, the, the tolerances, you know, the defaults are, are pretty strict tolerances that we, we find in, in ArcGIS. Adding attributes um, or indexes to your attributes. So if you know that a field is going to be queried or is going to be used in a pop-up or for visualization and symbology, add an attribute uh, index to that field, um, and that will really speed things up. It allows the the system to query those those variables um, a lot faster. Are there meaningful field aliases? This this one always gets me. Um, most people aren't going to be experts with your data. So you're gonna to have to tell them, you know, what is in, you know, the, the field column header, um, you know, if it's some kind of um, esoteric acronym, nobody's gonna understand that. So you can also put in aliases into those so it displays and you understand that um, FY007 is actually variable, you know, whatever, and, and make it, you know, human readable. Um, enabling queries, so uh, pop-ups can um, can be displayed, or people can get the data back out if it's a if it's a feature layer. Um, and you know, if you're dealing with map services, publishing to your to your portal also to allow people to edit how that that data looks and and copy and export it. 
Um, lastly, I'm going to talk about making it usable. Um, so this is the stuff that you would do after you publish it. So make sure that the, the symbology is intuitive and can be understood by a variety of people. So, you know, I always like to say, think about, you know, the colorblind people out there. Can, can they understand it? Um, is the message um, being conveyed um, in the use of, of your symbology as well? Um, if you're going to be updating your layer, like writing over it, um, completely doing a, an overwrite, use what we call a feature layer view. That way it protects your pop-ups and your symbology from getting blown away when you completely overwrite that layer. Um, there's lots of documentation on that and we'll provide that in the resources as well. But it's basically you create a child to the parent service. Um, and so you'll have multiple views of, of the data that you can also configure to, um, let's say only show a couple of the fields and uh, or you know restrict one area uh, for people to view. So it's, it makes these things very flexible, but also more efficient. Did you enable caching? So in your settings in ArcGIS Online, there's some, some settings for caching. We can see this one set for 30 seconds. This data isn't gonna change, set that to one hour. So there's a greater likelihood that the data will be cached in ArcGIS Online. There's also some optimizations that you can enable here. Um, is your description detailed enough? So you know, when you first publish something, there's no information there. But if somebody's going to take this layer and try to work with it, you really have to contextualize it. And don't make them go to some other website that probably has a PDF that in two years is going to be broken. Um, so, you know, put the details into the item description. It makes it that much easier. And then this information is also available in, you know, in the metadata for the item when you're in ArcGIS Pro or in any, any of our other uh, software technologies. And lastly, did you customize the pop-up? This is not a customized pop-up. Um, and we can see here that this is not a very meaningful experience. Instead, choose the layers that you want. Um, use aliases to describe what they are and, and use sentences or um, some custom configurations so that these actually, again, become meaningful information products instead of just data. And so with that, I'm going to pass this off to uh, George, and he's going to give us some best practices about how to configure your systems for, um, for WebGIS. So take it away, George. Thank you, Dan. My name is George Sauer, and as you services, um, the geospatial technology and strategic advisor. And today I'm going to talk to you about um, how do we kind of architect our systems and look at it from that perspective um, going forward? So when you're designing a weather and climate related system, I think that you need to start with asking yourself some questions. What do I want to provide as a product? What information am I trying to convey with this data? This, this data and information products could be imagery or raster-based products, feature data or vector-based products. You could provide pre-populated maps or apps, as Dan has showed, or maybe a dashboard to help convey risk to the end users like you saw with the SAFER. You also want to take into consideration who is your target audience with this data. Would this be for the general public, meteorologists, emergency managers, academia, researchers, the GIS community at large? or other um, user bases. All of these considerations, along with the recommendations that Dan and Julia mentioned related to service performance and design best practices, should be taken into consideration when designing your system to really bring it into that global GIS system. We also want to think about the update frequency of the data that we're providing. Will it be updated hourly, daily, weekly, etc.? So you can also take advantage of caching, as Dan just mentioned. Do we need to meet specific standards for these data services? Does it need to be served out as WMC or WCS services? Or is just a REST endpoint from an ArcGIS service okay? Do the end users need to have feature access or visualization, as Dan talked about earlier? Do you want to have those pre-configured and informative pop-ups available you know, using the field aliases? And when we talk about the specifics of architecture, the first thing that we usually think of is in terms of how many or how large my servers should be. Will you be implementing your deployment within your local infrastructure or within a public private cloud like Azure, Amazon Web Services, Google, or others? Will I need a relational database management system, something like Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server? 
or will my data reside in a file database or just on disk? If you're using imagery in your products, you also want to investigate where the best place to have the source files reside and in what formats are appropriate. This could be using cloud-optimized geotiffs or cloud raster formats or MRFs that you're stored in your S3 or Azure blobs, or they could be stored within your local data store. Are you also going to be providing you know, mosaic data sets as an image service to expand those capabilities? As part of the overall architecture, you want to think about the individual components needed for you to be successful, the questions that you asked yourself earlier. Do you need a full ArcGIS enterprise configuration, or do you just need ArcGIS server with image server role? Do you need auto scaling, or maybe multiple full-time servers to handle the anticipated and expected workloads? Is there an expectation that this data will always be available? Do you have some sort of SLA as part of your business? For example, the data from the National Weather Service is critical for forecasters and the public. There's an expectation that it will be available 24-7. With this information, you can add it to your planning and overall architecture to help meet the needs of your organization. With all the information in your architecture built, then you can really go and develop the workflows for data ingestion and dissemination. As you can see on the left of the slide, we have these data sources available to help create the services. Some of these sources are cloud-based data, databases, geodatabases, analysis models, online content and services, like from the Living Atlas of the World, or tabular and spatial data, like CSV files, shape files, file geodatabases, PDF words, et cetera. In the middle of the slide, we really have these pathways for this data dissemination. You can publish the data to ArcGIS Enterprise in the top section, which allows you to provide the data in purpose-built web maps, apps, and dashboards, or other information products. You can also enable your users to create their own maps, apps, and dashboard if that's the way you would like to go. Publishing using ArcGIS Enterprise would allow you to provide the full capabilities and functionalities of the software and your technology to the end users. An example of data being provided this way is by creating a dashboard or web map to convey flood risk to your local community. But just as easily you can publish to enterprise, you can also just publish your services out to ArcGIS server, that you see in the bottom section, with both the ArcGIS server and image server capabilities enabled. This allows you to just provide the data products and a REST OGC service for the end users to utilize. This allows those end users to create their own applications, maps, apps, and dashboards, and additional information products. An example of data being provided this way is by the National Weather Service at weather.gov. And you can access their data services directly and use them as inputs for your analysis or visualization. With both of these pathways, the end user can then add additional content from their local data sources or from rich data sources in the Living Atlas to help increase the value of the information they're trying to create. As you can see, the information is provided to the decision makers or the analysts for the use. It's an, and it is also important to note that they need to get these um, information products to the end users in a reliable and timely manner. And finally, given all these approaches, there are national hydrology centers which are using ArcGIS Enterprise for their flood forecasting and other services. An example that is of a center that is taking advantage of the ArcGIS Enterprise type of deployment pattern is the NOAA National Water Center. They currently have some experimental interactive web maps using the National Water Model's data inputs that you can access at water.noaa.gov. They've also been working with Esri on a cloud strategy to make the future services more resilient, scalable, and highly available. As you can see on the slide, this is a generalization of a type of cloud-based deployment that, you, that would help support your data dissemination needs. All the icons in the middle, middle represent these maps, apps, dashboards, the type of data, whether it's vector, raster, video, and the people who may be using the data to make decisions. The large green arrow shows how data can flow to and from the end products and the users back to the data sources. The actual infrastructure and enterprise deployment can be located in different cloud regions and they can be synced automatically. Overall, these considerations can be taken across all industries and organizations from serving internal clients and business units to also serving the general public and partners. 
Thank you, and I'll hand it back to Lorraine. Thank you so much, team. So, so far we have described how to leverage a fully web-enabled GIS to improve the dissemination of diverse set of data and products and information um, through many different um, format of many different formats and many different ways. We hope that you found the best practices for highly performant web services and architecting your dissemination service were useful. If you have additional questions on these topics as well, please put them in the Q&A because we're about to open up our Q&A um, session in a moment. Um, we have been receiving questions throughout the presentation and we will address those. Also, you can send us questions at this email address presented on the screen here, science at esri.com. And again, we also want to remind you to, before we go into Q&A, to please feel free to join us for the next two webinars coming up, one on June 23rd and the other one on August 25th. And again, all of the resources and um, con uh, examples that we talked about here will be provided in a follow-up email, a whole list of resources so that you can um, further enhance your skill set on data dissemination. So for now, we will open it up to the Q&A session and the whole team will be taking part on this. And so the first question um, we have is the Water Balance app. Is this a free app? Dan, since you're the one who brought this up, maybe you can take this question. Sure, Water Balance app is free. You can find it at livingatlas.arcgis.com along with a variety of other open uh, uh, apps and, and data layers. Yes, and Dan, I think um, on the Climate Hub, which is, is a resource that we will have available to the users, this will be provided in your email, a link to this resource. Um, perhaps the, those types of things are available on that site as well. Correct, and there's a variety of other climate-related um, apps that are also included in the hub. Sure. Okay, um, next up, I see one. I think this would be for um, George. Um, the two cloud regions, can they have different data and still sync together? I think that's referring to your last architecture example that you presented. Oh, yes. Um, no, usually if they're in different cloud regions in that kind of highly available deployment, they would have the same data sets um, across them. But it makes it highly available where if for some reason one of those cloud regions went down, your services would still be available to the general public and the decision makers during that time frame. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then... Um, another question was, how hard is it to create a configurable application using ArcGIS Online? Is there training that I can find to be able to do that? Maybe that could be a question for Julia. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so it's quite simple to create a configurable application. None of it requires coding. It's all um, done through um, a user experience. And yeah, there's quite a bit of training. I'm sure we've included some in our resource list on our um on our website, so in our documentation, as well as learn lessons. So learn.arcgis.com has a lot of different lessons to get you started creating, and whether it be a web app, um, a dashboard, story map, there's a lot of different trainings to get you started with that. Yes, thanks for that, Julia. Yes, and of course, I'm going to keep re reminding um, in the email that we will follow up. We've selected, the team here has selected a few um, learn lessons and training tutorials that would help you get started if you're interested in that. So look forward to that tomorrow. Um, the next question is, um, and maybe this would be Dan, um, how, Arch oh, wait, no, how does ArcGIS handle polar and stereo projection when the area of interest are located so close to the poles? Right. So if that's the case, you know, and, and we have the example of the National Ice Center, um, most of that data is projected in polar stereographic. Um, and then you can create web maps that um, use a polar stereographic base map. Um, if you have a point, you know, or line, you know, some kind of feature um, that is in that coordinates or that um, that you want to map into polar stereographic, it will automatically remap in ArcGIS. 
Um, if it's a tile, it cannot because those tiles are pre-configured to a specific uh, projection or coordinate system. Um, but anything else, even an image really layer, they, they can reproject. Um, but I would say if you know that everybody is going to be using it in a particular uh, coordinate system to reproject your data into that, uh, because it will just be that much more efficient. Okay, great, thank you. And we have another question on, how can I learn more about the design and architect of a weather and climate or climate platform? Are there resources associated with that as well? That would be for George, I guess. Um, our, our resources are generally available in terms of architecture um, within the help documentation. If you go to like enterprise.arcgis.com, there's um, some system design considerations within there. I would say that each weather uh, dissemination platform does have specific considerations, but in general, the architecture that I showed could be used across multiple different um, departments and organizations. Okay. Um, here's a question on, do you know if there are plans to build a web app or dashboard editing functionality in ArcGIS Pro? Something akin to some of the JSON editing one what it can do on do an ArcGIS Online Assistant. Uh, but I'll, I'll take that, Lorraine. Um, sure. There are not, um, so one capability that you can do in ArcGIS Pro right now is edit, you can bring your web map in that's already published online, edit that and save it directly, and that refreshes live. Uh, there's no plan that I know of to have some of the other web app or dashboard um, editing capability in Pro, we really try to limit um, the complexity. You know, that, that's just adding more and more panels and, and making the, the software a lot larger. So we, we do want to kind of make sure that we're making the ArcGIS Pro as, as, as tight and usable as possible. And so um, moving, you know, just keeping those things in one spot in ArcGIS Online is, is the general plan. Okay, thank you. Um, now, Living Atlas question. Um, is there air quality data, example PM2 or NOx or SOx available in the Living Atlas of the world? Sure, we do have um, real-time um, air quality station data. Um, we don't, and, and then we have some things like um, uh, for the continental unit, United States, we do have um, uh, weather for or air quality forecast data from NOAA. Um, we do have some other um, more static, so not uh, updating. Um, air quality data and, and analyses that have been contributed, but nothing like um, real-time um, uh, NO2 from Sentinel uh, yet. We, we hope to get that uh, either contributed by, by uh, people or developed, but if you, if you have these services, we're interested in getting them contributed from other organizations into uh, Living Atlas. Sure, yes, we're, we're always adding data into the Living Atlas. So um, again, if you have interest, please reach out to us. Um, here's a question about NetCDF and how do you bring NetCDF and display it in multi-dimensional raster, a raster data set, display it as a multi-dimensional raster data set. I know we have a training course on that, but maybe quickly you guys could answer. Sure, you can um, go into, there's a couple ways. You can add data from the add data button and choose the multi-dimensional raster option. And then you can bring in NetCDF Grib or HDF through that. And then there's several geoprocessing tools that you can, um, that will read NetCDF. Um, so there's a lot of ways. And as uh, Lorraine said, we'll have a learn lesson um, in the resources list that, that kind of talks about that. Great. Um, here's one on publishing data or apps. Is there a limit? To ha um, is there a cap on how much is published online? Yes, publishing does consume credits in your ArcGIS Online, um, not if you have enterprise, so that's one of those balances. Um, so, uh, but yes, there there are certain you know, constraints. Okay, sure. Um, some more for you, Dan, on around the time it took to develop, develop an app such as the Air Quality Aware or the Water Balance app um, with, with what was the experience of the ind individual working on that. So maybe level of effort and time. 
Yeah, so we developed uh, the air quality one very rapidly in response to the issues last year. It took about three days of um, very hardworking three days uh, with one developer using our ArcGIS uh, JavaScript API. Um, uh, and But that's because all the data was already available and we've kind of done these apps before. But I think in general, if you have a, a pretty decent um, JavaScript uh, developer, that they could be developed when, within a matter of, of weeks. Sure, okay. Yeah, and again, um, in the resources, there's um, a learn lesson that will help you get started. Um, and each of the learn lessons tend to be about, you know, 30 minutes to an hour um, to get you up and running. So it's pretty quick. And you, like we've heard before, you don't need to have, need to have any coding. Um, okay, let's see. Is there work being done to incorporate the National Medicine Program, um, the new climate norms model, our products? I'm going to say that's uh, into Living Atlas. Um, we would love to have those uh, contributed. Um, that is not on the slate of development um, internally at Esri for Living Atlas, but um, we, that would be something that could be a great uh, contribution. So please feel free to reach out to me. Sure. Um, and I, th I think we had the email addresses of everybody before, um, but on the screen right now, we just have scienceit at esri.com, but all of us have access to that email alias, so please feel free to send additional questions to that address and we'll be sure to get back to you. Um, then, oh, I, I, let's see, the um, safe, safer hazard dashboard that was shown earlier is that accessible to all i can answer that yeah that is sure. a public link um that we can yeah include in our resources yeah we'll add that one to the resource i don't know if we had it but we'll make sure we have it and again this email will go out tomorrow so it looks like we're at the top of the hour we don't want to go over um, we want to thank you so much for all your time today. There was a couple extra questions in the chat. We'll make sure we have those answered in the return email. And again, please join us for future webinars. So this now concludes our webinar. Thank you so much.